Good morning, those of you who are joining us from the Pacific, Mountain West, and Central Time Zones. And good afternoon to those of you joining us from Eastern Time. I am Will Walden, and this is Steve Cruzel at Quarles and Brady, and we're delighted to spend the next hour with you on the topic of animal accommodations. Before we get underway, let me start, as we always do, with a few housekeeping announcements for those of you joining us on the web. We will be applying for one hour of CLE credit. If you are an attorney and would like to receive CLE credit for attending today's program, please fill out the CLE form located at the back of the materials found in the handouts panel of the webinar dashboard. Please complete the form and return it to the contact listed at the bottom of the document. There is also an HR certificate of attendance for those of you human professionals attending the program, and it's in the attendance form in the dashboard materials for you to use for self-reporting. We have muted all phone lines for those dialing in and for participants in audio via computer. You are in listen-only mode at this time. We would like for you to be aware that this presentation is being recorded, and we will issue an electronic survey to you by mail after the program. <clears throat> And perhaps most importantly of the housekeeping announcements, if any webinar participants have a question, and Steve and I certainly invite you to submit those questions, here's how you do it. Please type your question into the chat box located in the upper right corner of the webinar dashboard and hit submit. We have a uh, hour today and we'll try to address most of the questions, substantially all the questions that come in, time permitting. So let's have a conversation. Steve, how's it going today? I'm doing well. Excited to talk about service animals and emotional support animals. All right. We're going to learn the difference between the two. And we should. Yes. And we should. Now, we've got a roadmap of interesting topics today. These are the three subjects, really, that we find surfacing with the animal accommodation issue. And we've had conversations about some of the other issues that can arise, you know, certainly when you've got animals... Uh, attempting to be brought onto planes, or I was just looking at the EEOC guidance published earlier this year on employers who have in the food service industry and the EEOC having some comment in those regulations about uh, service dogs at, if you're in a place that's covered by the FDA code. There are just a myriad and host of issues and Steve and I to make difficult decisions about time constraints uh, and limited time and these are the three subjects that we're covering today within our time, but we certainly want to invite anyone to contact us offline if you experience or confronting issues with animal accommodations that fall outside of three, these three realms. We're more than happy and invite you to have a discussion with us about those as well. And we'll have a Q&A near the end of the segment. Yeah, I think to Will's point, we tried to be very intentional today about what we're talking about. And ask everybody listening um, at your office or at home, wherever you might be, to really focus on the areas. We're going to start in employment. Um, so as an employer, what are your duties to accommodate individuals with service animals or requests? Um, then we're going to move to places of public accommodation. And if you are a place of public accommodation, what do you need to do for patrons or guests who are coming on um, to your property with service animals? And then lastly, we're going to focus on higher education institutions or places that offer housing to individuals and what are your requirements. So as we go through the presentation, we will try and be very specific about the areas we're talking about, but make sure you're watching the slides as well to, to make sure you're looking out for that because the requirements for each of those areas are a bit different and we don't want anyone to be confused by right. it. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point, Steve. And here's the other thing we talked about as we were preparing for this presentation is we'll certainly have moments of levity during the presentation, particularly when you're talking about peacocks uh, <laughs> or pigs. and sugar gliders, yeah. which I frankly had to check National Geographic to, to know what that was. Um, but starting with a, a moment of seriousness, because service animals have been around for a long time. And historically, and certainly I think appropriately, we've always thought of service animals as providing a critical, uh, delivering critical needs, uh, handling critical needs for the people that they serve. And we have here kind of a figure of how many service animals are trained and working in the United States. That's no doubt an approximation uh, from, the, the, from the data that we have. But the lion's share, no pun intended, of these service dogs are 
uh, much like everyone who's tuned in today for the webinar, um, doing a great job and, and working in kind of in a high value sense and performing work for the people that they serve. So the, and what we've, what we've really been seeing uh, recently is a real expansion in the types of needs that people are uh, using for animals. And going beyond the kind of more traditional service dog or the, even, even the emotional support animal, you're now seeing animals characterized as psychiatric support or therapeutic animals. And you'll have some clini clinicians even tell you that these types of animals are, do have kind of an ameliorative function and can alleviate some of the symptoms of mental health and emotional health issues. Now, here's where the tension lies. And this is probably what we've seen over the past five years. It's the sort of exceptional case involving somebody who's looking to take advantage of the situation or maybe bring in their personal pet and masquerade it as a service animal or even as an emotional support animal. And then if you compound that with the sort of cottage industry of sort of suspect credentialing organizations that will provide dubious uh, or outright uh, bogus credentials to kind of unsuspecting people that say registered service animal when we know there's no official U.S. registry of service animals or emotional support animals. It's that kind of convergence of factors that I think has raised the uh, a skepticism in many people's minds about the legitimacy of these requests. And really, it, it creates, creates kind of the importance to understand these issues, and particularly for your team members to have a game plan and to recognize, uh, at least have kind of a familiarity with the legal standards as you try to navigate the issues. So, yeah. I think that the other important thing as we bring our PowerPoint back online is the distinction between a service animal and emotional support animal, particularly as the variety of animals continues to expand. When you're talking about a service animal, uh, that's, and uh, you'll see in the ADA regulations, we'll talk about this, the regulations for the Americans Disabilities Act and for the Fair Housing Act, that definition is usually contemplating a service dog or a miniature horse, and that's the type of dog or miniature horse that has, has trained to perform a task or work for a disabled individual. And you'll have sometimes dogs that can recognize when a diabetic individual is having lower blood sugar, or the, for somebody who's dealing with anxiety or panic disorder, you sometimes have dogs that have been trained to recognize where they're getting ready to be a panic attack or anxiety attack and to maybe put, the, put a paw on that individual to alleviate those symptoms. C9 dog is another one that I think is very common and people are That's right. you know, comfortable with or know. That's a hallmark example. And then contrast that with the emotional support animal, which provides companionship to an individual but is not necessarily performing a specific task or specific work. One example that immediately comes to mind for me is I had a client that where an employee wanted to bring in a small dog just to sit under the desk for, during, during the workday small enough to sit under the desk, not particularly performing any type of work or any type of task, but just there for companionship. And that's, that's generally going to be an emotional support or a comfort animal. Now, let's say that you've got an, one of your employees who wants to bring in that comfort animal and lodge it under the desk at work. What's your game plan? What, what's going to be your first step? So if you have an employee in the workplace that wants to bring in an animal and they want to bring that animal in for a medical or health condition, you are most likely going to have an issue that you need to address under the Americans with Disabilities Act or potentially a state law or municipal law equivalent. Now let's talk about the ADA for a second. Now if you weren't able to join us earlier this year for our complex issues in ADA webinar, let me give you a quick primer. It's the same primer we provide at that time, generally what does the ADA cover? What types of medical or health conditions? And really for, for coverage under the ADA, it's the physical uh, or the mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. It's simple enough for you to commit it to memory, Steve. 
And since the 2008 amendments to the ADA, it's become very easy, much easier uh, for uh, physical or mental impairment to have coverage under the ADA. Now, when you've got a disabled individual requesting the animal uh, or making any type of accommodation request, again, the ADA requires reasonable accommodations for qualified disabled in individuals. Now, that term, qualified disabled individuals, that's an important term. You sometimes hear people abbreviate it by saying quid, using that phrase quid. And what is a quid? That is somebody who's qualified, applicant or an employee, qualified for the position that they, that they seek or, or that they hold or desire, and able to perform the essential functions of that job with or without reasonable accommodation. So when you're dealing with a qualified disabled individual, you've got to evaluate uh, any request for reasonable accommodation. And the ADA also imposes a requirement that you engage in the interactive process as part of evaluating the accommodation request. Now, what does the interactive process, what does that phrase mean? It's really an interactive dialogue. It's a conversation, an exchange of information and facts between, the, between management and the applicant or the employee about the nature of the need, employee's need, the reason for the need, the features of the need, kind of, and what are the parameters that the employee seeks, uh, as well as whether or not the, you as the employer are going to be able to reasonably accommodate, reasonably accommodate without undue hardship to your business operation. Now, when it comes to requests for animals in the workplace, the Title I of the ADA, which is, which is where we are right now for private employers, does not have a definition for service animal. And what that means, and to, to hint a little bit at what I'm going to talk about momentarily, um, but what that means is when somebody's asking you or requesting uh, to have an animal as an accommodation, you're probably going to have to engage in that interactive process or consider it as a request for an accommodation, regardless of whether it is a service animal or an emotional support or comfort animal. Again, because there's no definition of service animal in Title I of the ADA. Now, the reasonable, the interactive process certainly can, can become cumbersome in certain situations and it does, does require some effort by your team members. But what I like to, to advise clients is to look at the positive aspects of the interactive process and think of the upside. Because the real upside is here's your opportunity to really gather and collect information about the nature of the request for the animal. You're certainly entitled as part of the interactive process to collect information from the employee about their need for the animal, the, the type of restrictions or functional limitations that the applicant or employee may have that they believe requires or necessitates them to have an animal in the workplace. You're also entitled to some information about the animal itself. How does the animal behave? What type of animal is it? Um, what function does the animal perform for the applicant or the employee? And Really, does that animal have a history of behaviors that may become problematic in your work environment? What type of training has the animal received? And is that training, does that training correspond to the services the animal is delivering to the employee? And think about it, this is all directed at trying to understand how that animal is going to behave in your work environment and whether or not you can reasonably accommodate the animal's entry and whether or not there's going to be an undue hardship placed on your operation. Those are all important pieces of information that you can solicit and opportunity to solicit as part of the interactive process. And one thing I would add there is, you know, you're also wanting to think about whether you can offer another potential accommodation. Right. You know, that is part of the ADA process. You don't have to necessarily give the employee the accommodation they request. So if there's something that you can offer the employee that would allow them to perform the function that the animal is trained to perform, that's another alternative to think about and to discuss with the employee yeah, you know, as part of that process. And that's why it's so important to really engage in robust interactive process. That's the exact, that's the exact insight, Steve. You know, I call that the, can you achieve the same clinical objective that the employee might have through an alternative means Absolutely. as part of the interactive process? And we're definitely entitled to explore that. Now, we also wanted to alert you I mean, just include a slide so that you keep in mind state disability discrimination law. Sometimes it falls under a state fair employment practice law. These are state-based and sometimes even at the municipal level in cities 
laws that are going to regulate disability discrimination and potentially require reasonable accommodation. Really, we wanted to include this for two reasons. One is, if you, if you fall below that coverage threshold that I had on my previous slide for the ADA, if you're too small of an employer to really uh, fall within the coverage of the ADA, you may still have obligations under state disability or reasonable accommodation laws because those coverage thresholds tend to be lower, potentially municipal ones as well. And the other reason to keep in mind state and municipal laws is they sometimes have superlative obligations that go beyond the ADA. And I included two examples here on this slide, just to make sure that when you have an issue of a request for an animal in the workplace, you always, always, always have counsel, inside or outside counsel, consider, uh, take a look at the state laws or the municipal laws for your potential obligations. So what about the Fed, Steve? Now, later on in our presentation, you're going to talk about how the Department of Justice enforces and regulates certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the federal agency that may have a regulatory perspective and viewpoint about the workplace, uh, particularly for private employers? The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, so the EEOC, enforces Title I of the ADA. Now, the EEOC has interpretive regulations on Title I of, of the ADA. And those interpretive regulations cover a lot of issues, reasonable accommodation, everything from when is it appropriate to make a medical inquiry from an employee to when is there going to be an undue hardship to the business operation arising from an accommodation request. But one thing that those, those regulations do not cover is the definition of a service animal. Can't make it easy on us. Well, if it did, then, you know, hey, <laughs> we may not have jobs. Have it done. We're not doing this. Um, but they, it, it, so that definition is not there, and nor is any type of uh, statements in those regulations, at least not yet, about when is it reasonable to uh, welcome a service animal or an emotional support animal into your workplace. So what you're left with is inter applying kind of uh, treating the request for an animal in the same way you would a request for any other type of job related accommodation from an employee with the interactive process and of course considering it for reasonableness and whether or not there's an undue hardship. The other important I think practical implication of there not being a real definition for for service animal and emotional support animal in those regulations is that there is no regular there's no basis in the EEOC regulations to distinguish between service animals and emotional support animals in the workplace and what that means is that if the employee or the applicant wants to bring a service animal that may well be trained to, to work or to do tasks, or if they're, if they're bringing in an emotional support or comfort dog that merely sits on the desk, you're going to have to consider that and think about that, uh, those both as requests for job-related accommodation and, of course, consider the interactive process, consider that whether or not you can, for reasonableness and undue hardship. The EEOC takes aim at no pet policies. You know, again, they don't discriminate between service animals and, and emotional support animals. And they're looking for that good faith interactive process as an indicia that you're complying with the ADA. Again, with, when it comes to regulatory activity, also consider state agencies or municipal agencies that may enforce the respective um, disability discrimination statutes in states and cities. Now, here's a recent example, I think, that illustrates some of these points with the EEOC. Now, this is the Enforcement Action EEOC and CRST, and many of you may have followed this. It's probably one of the, the enforcement actions involving animal accommodations that was, that's been most publicized over the past couple of years. Now, this case involved uh, an applicant who saw a long haul driver position at CRST and the long haul driver position in involves driving longer distances and potentially having to sleep away from home while you're doing those driving duties. The applicant had served the uh, country in, in Iraq and had developed a little bit of PTSD and uh, there was an issue with nightmares that the applicant was experiencing and had an animal, a dog, that addressed some of that. So during the nighttime, the, the dog would would rouse the, the, the gentleman um, if he was struggling with some of the PTSD at night. So the applicant uh, wanted to be able to bring the animal with him in the event he had to sleep at night. 
And at the time, CRST had a, had a no pet policy restriction on being able to have animals in vehicles. And you can see the reasons why that, why that would be an issue for them. Uh, but they didn't immediately decline to, to hire. They, they tried to find, work a solution with the applicant. Ultimately, the, um, they couldn't find a solution and that applicant was not hired. The a charge was then uh, filed at the EEOC and an enforcement action ensued in 2017. And that culminated with a consent decree um, that CRST entered into earlier this year. And there's a lot of things that we can discuss, Steve, about that consent decree and the facts of this case. But I think the key takeaways for those who joined the webinar today were the EEOC's viewpoints and perspectives during that enforcement action. The first is that if you thought that these types of requests for emotional support animals or other types of animals were per se unreasonable, there was once a time where you'd say, well, it's not a service animal, we're not even going to consider it. Uh, EEOC has moved uh, to a much different place on that, and they, they no longer say it's reasonable. They are looking for you to, to commence that interactive process. That's the second point here on this slide. Uh, and this is why they have the no pet policies in their crosshairs, because it really is the type of inflexible policy that the EEOC is looking for employers to revise as, and, and to really engage in an interactive process in compliance with the ADA. And then the third point is what I mentioned earlier is the EEOC just expressed that they want to see a Title I ADA reasonable accommodation analysis when you get the request for an animal, regardless of whether the animal actually qualifies as a service animal. That appeared in one of the EEOC's briefs on the case. Mm -hmm. Where does this leave you in terms of your game plan? This is where we started. I'm going to bring it full circle. First consideration you might make is to consider and revise no pet policies. Again, this is what went into the EEOC's crosshairs and consider whether or not you're going to incorporate language around reasonable accommodations for quids, qualified individuals with disabilities, and develop that language into the policy. And then I always advise clients to develop a specific protocol about how you're going to react to these types of requests. At the very least, it's because a lot of times what we see is when this request comes in the door, it leads to some panic. Yes. The, the, um, I mean, there, there's a lot of implications for having an animal in the workplace, um, and certainly the first thing is to panic. When you have a protocol, a lot of times you can mitigate some of that reflex to panic. And what might that protocol have? Internal communication pathways. Who, regardless of who the request comes to, who is going to, where is that information going to be escalated? Who is going to own the process? Who, uh, which stakeholders are going to need to review this as you consider whether or not it's reasonable or an undue hardship? What type of information would you like to collect? Earlier I talked about your opportunity as part of the interactive process to collect information about the nature of the request and, and really not to squander that opportunity. And so as, as if it's your HR team or other management teams who are going to have those discussions with the employee and collect that information, uh, be, coach and counsel them on what type of information you want at your disposal to be able to make a prudent decision about how to proceed. Um, and so they're equipped with that. And then one of the big things that I've seen come up with these is once if you're going to grant the accommodation, the animal comes to the workplace, you may have other employees that are going to raise countervailing issues about it. Mm -hmm. And you might have employees, obviously, with, with pet dander allergies or different types of fears about animals. And you're, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna approach your, your frontline management team. They may approach your HR people. And you're going to want to kind of coach and counsel around what types of pieces of information, what's the message going to be? Uh, there's some limitations in the ADA and usually in state uh, laws around what the type of information you can disclose about the accommodation you provided for one employee. And so you want to delicately handle those communications and be able to equip your management team to deliver the message in a delicate and nuanced way. And cannot um, to say again to consider any state and municipal laws that might have special obligations. All right, now how is how is place of public accommodations different, Steve? It is a, it's a lot different. Well, first off, it's helpful that we actually have some definitions here that we're working with. <laughs> that would so always help. That does help. And I think um, you know, we'll review those first and then we'll sort of talk about some of the, the key differences. So first, how do you know if you are a place of public accommodation? Um, you know, the ADA defines it pretty broadly and it's just 
are you open to the public? Right. So the way to think about that is, are you a restaurant? Are you a hotel? Are you a theater? Are you a doctor's office where members of the public are coming in either as customers or patrons um, to use your services, to you know, uh, be seen by individuals at your place of business? Um, if, if you fall within that, you are likely a place of public accommodation. And what the ADA uh, says about places of public accommodation is that they have a duty to allow service animals into their place of business. And they do give a very specific definition as to what qualifies as a service animal. And as Will talked about earlier, that is a dog or a miniature horse. That's what falls within Title III of the ADA, which applies to public accommodations, definition as to what constitutes a service animal. Um, and the dog or miniature horse has to be able to perform a task or do work uh, related to the individual's disability. Um, they don't have to be professionally trained. They don't have to be identified, so they don't have to be wearing a certain type of vest, um, but they have to be able to do those things to qualify as a service animal. And, you know, as I had said, the general rule at place of public accommodation is that the service animal must be allowed in all areas of the facility where the public is allowed to go. So if you let the public in um, and you give them a tour of your uh, facility, whether it's a brewery or whether it's a um, candy making shop, um, if you let the public walk through those places, the service animal has to be allowed to go in those places. And there's two really limited exceptions under the ADA. And that is whether the animal poses a legitimate safety risk or if there would be a fundamental alteration to the nature of your services by letting the animal in. Oh, so like this bear on this slide. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So bear would probably fundamentally alter uh, essentially all services, I would say. But I don't want to go that far because uh, we always learn in this area that um, we could be wrong. And these are really narrow exceptions. Right. Um, that's the thing I, I really want people to walk away from if you are an operator of a place of public accommodation. What you may think um, would fun fundamentally alter the nature of your services likely might not. Um, and you need to be cautious of that if you are going to rely on that exception. And we'll talk a little bit more of what some of the EEOC's examples are on it. But I wanted to note um, that if you do allow a service animal in, um, you know, one of the two exceptions you have once they're in um, and you may decide to remove them, um, is if the animal is out of control and the individual who has brought the animal in does not take control of it, or if the animal is not housebroken. Um, those are sort of the two grounds you have uh, as a operator of a place of public accommodation to remove the animal. Now, I wouldn't do this lightly, um, and I would always document it if that's the route that your client's going to go, because if this were ever challenged um, as removing it, you want to know the sequence of what happened and, and why you took the steps to remove an animal. Um, and if the animal is excluded, you have to allow the individual to come back in without the animal to access your goods and services. You can't have like an outright ban. Yeah, that's an interesting piece. They've got to be able to come right back without the animal yeah. to enjoy the, the services. Absolutely, unless you have another grounds to remove them, but right. typically that's probably not going to occur. So we talked a little bit about that fundamentally alter the nature of the service. And I want to give the examples that the EOC has given just to show kind of really how narrow they are. So one example is if you are an operator of a, of a dormitory or, or a housing um, unit and you have a specific dorm that is designated for individuals with allergies to dog dander, allowing a service dog into that area where their dander would be spread and individuals with allergies would be immediately impacted, that the EEOC has said fundamentally alters the nature of that dorm. Um, so you do not have to allow a dog into that area, but if there was a common area or another dorm where something like that did not exist, the, EO would say, the EEOC would say that animal should be allowed in there like any other general member of the public. Um, the other exception they give, again, very narrow for any of our zoo operators online, um, if the animal that you're letting in would either be a predator or prey to certain animals in the zoo, um, you could exclude them from the areas where they would fall into either of those categories. Um, but if it's just a general area of the zoo where the animal would not be within realms of the other animals, um, they should be allowed in there. So that's really how narrow the EEOC's position is on this. Yeah, that's counterintuitive because on one hand, they recognize if 
the animal is going to be, other animals may become disturbed by the, the, the service animal's presence, but then in a situation where you're saying, well, my patrons might be disturbed or things like that, it, it, you're not going to have that narrow exception. So yeah. it's, it's a counterintuitive, and why it's always important um, to kind of take a look at it, look at it closely. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're thinking about relying on this and you really think, you know, I, I we have a strong argument, I believe we have a strong argument, this is something where engage your in-house legal counsel if you have it, engage external counsel because it really is a very narrow analysis. And if you're going to rely on that in, um, you know, regularly screening individuals or not allowing them in with animals, you want to be certain that um, there isn't any case law out there that might, you know, contradict this or there might be some other things to think about. Right. So. Um, you know, a question we get a lot from clients is, well, what can we ask, right? We, they, they don't have, the animals don't have to be identified. Um, you know, how do we know that this isn't a emotional support animal masquerading as a service animal, um, in a place of public accommodation? And the EOC says that there are two questions you can ask an individual. Um, and they are very specific, they're very narrow, and they're out on the slide. So the two questions are, is the animal required because of a disability? If you get a no to that, you can exclude the animal. But if you get a yes, you're allowed to ask one follow-up question. What work or task has the animal been trained to perform? If they answer that and say, you know, the animal has, uh, helps me walk, helps me guide me, um, you know, performs a function if I have a seizure, like you had talked about earlier, Will, um, that is it. You can't inquire further. You can't ask for a demonstration. Um, you can't ask for documentation of the disability. You really can't ask anything else. And that's what you want individuals to know. Um, you know, I worked with clients before on developing sort of a questionnaire for their sort of boots on the ground, individuals who are either tour guides or um, sort of front desk greeters, letting people in who would be the ones who would really be in the position to ask these questions. And they're very limited questionnaires. You know, you've got those two questions on there and it's just to check yes or no, yes or no, and what were the answers. And um, if you get credible answers to both those questions, um, you really can't do anything besides let the animal in and then monitor once they're inside. Um, you know, it, like we talked about earlier, if an animal is not housebroken when it's the animal's in there or if the animal is jumping on people or out of control, then you'd have grounds to remove the animal. But if not, you know, no further inquiry, no further investigation. And you really don't want your employees doing that anyways. It's going to set you up for unnecessary liability. Um, a lot of the employees in those positions probably wouldn't be equipped. Do we want them really reviewing, yeah. asking for medical documentation? They might not know what to ask. They, right? right? Yeah. So um, really keep this area narrow and focused um, and equip those individuals in those roles with, with those questions. So now, I've know. seen situations where... The individual walks in and says, this is a service animal, and immediately presents the documentation in support of that. Should the business worry about that? Well, they've, they've supplied documentation that we weren't supposed to seek, but they did it voluntarily. We didn't ask. I don't think it's something to be worried about, but I think that's a really good point, Will, that you should only be asking these questions if you aren't certain whether it's a service animal. So in that instance, sure. it'd be very clear that that animal's a service animal. Um, unless it were, you know, doing something or, or it fell outside of the EEOC's guidance on what constitutes a service animal in the public accommodation setting. Um, if it's a dog, though, and someone says this is a service animal right up to you, um, you know, there's not a reason to ask these questions unless you really have some doubt about that. So um, it's a good point, and, you know, but we don't need to review them. Your, your, your uh, front desk person doesn't need to be taking a look at them or making photocopies. You don't want them doing that. Um, you know, but I would just say thank you and, and kind of move on from there. Right. Yep. And, you know, while this isn't necessarily a question, this comes up a lot. Um, and if another patron who's at your building says, you know, they have an allergy or they have a fear of dog, uh, fear of dogs or fear of miniature horses, um, whatever it might be, in the public accommodation setting, that is not a valid reason for denying access or refusing service to people who have service animals. So, um, you know, I know that can be a really difficult situation, especially in the allergy context, because you're trying to balance two customers um, or two patrons, and you really want to get creative and, and give the individuals that um, are working for you the license to, to say, you know, um, this is where we put on our customer service hat. 
This is where we say, you know, well, what can I offer you? Can I have you go on a different tour? Can I, um, you know, have you go to this part of the facility and, and, and try and work with individuals in that context, knowing you cannot um, remove someone simply because someone else tells you that they have an allergy. Um, you know, it, the EEOC doesn't allow you to one way, way one over the other, as difficult as that may be. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah, that's real interesting. Quandary that you may be in. in yeah. Situations. So now we are going to go to our sort of last bucket here, which um, gets hit on every level, level essentially. Uh, and those are institutions, uh, higher education institutions. Oh, you're taking them to school. We are going to school. Um, and, and this also uh, uh, covers anyone who's a housing provider. Um, so, you know, it, it's particularly come up in higher education institutions, but some of the cases we'll talk about are condo associations as well in this area. Um, and what's unique here is um, they can kind of get hit at every level of the ADA because oftentimes they are employers. Um, they've got employees of their own who are dealing with the accommodation issues that Will talked about at the beginning. Um, they are often places of public accommodation, especially higher education institutions. You know, you have prospective students coming in for tours, you have um, lectures, you have presentations at the schools that um, are turn them into places of public accommodation. And uh, if they're providing housing, they're subject to the Fair Housing Act. And there's some very unique requirements in the Fair Housing Act, and that's in how they define what a um, service animal can be in that context. So we're going to move there now. So Entities, um, you know, and I've got here the definition of what types of entities are subject to the FHA and um, what, what a disability and service dog or service animal would be. Um, and the, the really specific part of this definition that is important is the second part. So after the comma, where you've got or provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified symptoms or affects person's disabilities. And the portion and why that's so important is that um, unlike under Title III of the ADA, which we just talked about, um, here it is very clear that the FHA is encompassing emotional support animals. Um, so it's not just a service dog, it's not just a miniature horse, it's um, a service animal, um, or an emotional support animal, excuse me. Um, so they can do those same functions potentially as a service animal, but it's also animals that provide emotional support. That are going to be covered here. So, Title One of ADA, no definition of service animal or emotional support. Def uh, title Three, definition for service animal, and by implication, what's excluded from that. But then here, straight up, a definition for emotional support animal. Yes, and very clearly included. And because of that, um, when higher education institutions have denied requests for emotional support animals, you can see what's happened. Um, they've wound up with very expensive settlements. Um, we've got three examples up here, one from Grand Valley State for $40,000 um, when a student asked for an emotional support guinea pig to live with her in her dorm. Um, two students from University of Nebraska asked for emotional support animals. The university settled for over $140,000 or $440,000. And then Kent State paid a couple um, who lived together who wanted an uh, emotional support dog um, to be with them for um, the wife's anxiety, um, $100,000 when they deny that request. And you've got to pay that and then welcome the emotional support animal into the institution. Exactly, yeah. And, and so, you know, I think that's why we've seen um, a huge influx, not only in these requests, um, but also in higher education institutions granting them and having to deal with having all these animals. Um, so, you know, just one thing to think about, um, you know, like there were permitted inquiries under the ADA, Title III, that we talked about public accommodations. Um, here there are permitted inquiries as well. They're fairly limited. Um, and really you're trying to figure out, you know, does the person making a request have a disability related need for an assistance animal? And again, the language changes a little bit there because it's not just, you know, does this perform a job? It's, is this assisting in some capacity? So it can be assisting from the emotional side. Um, and, and that's what you yeah, really need to say. Subtle think about. but significant difference in language. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a really big distinction here is that in the fair housing context, breed of animal, size of animal, weight limitations cannot be applied. 
um, and uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, interesting results that that's led to at colleges. Um, but you you cannot place those limitations on um, the type of animal that will qualify as a service or support animal. Um, and the only basis you have for excluding under the FHA um, at sort of at the out, outset is whether or not the specific animal poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others. Um, now, this is a very nuanced and um, a tailored inquiry. Um, it is very hard to achieve. It's a high standard, and it's an individualized assessment that's based on the specific animal in question. Um, and, you know, really want to think about that. Um, you can't be just saying, you know, someone makes a request to have an emotional support pit bull. Um, you know, you can say, well, I think most pit bulls are dangerous or, or pit bulls have a tendency to be dangerous. Um, so that's going to be our basis to exclude them. Under the FHA, that is flatly wrong. You cannot do that. It has to be this specific pit bull, we'll call him Fluffy. Um, <laughs> Fluffy has to have a history of engaging in aggressive or violent conduct that would show that he has a specific, poses a specific direct threat to others. Um, so you can show, that's really difficult to establish. Um, so unless you have that type of evidence, um, you know, it, it's gonna be very hard for you to show um, that this should be excluded, right. this type of animal should be excluded. You almost have to include the animal and then see. See what happens out. after, exactly. And that's what we've seen people doing. And so um, here's a few examples from colleges um, that are fairly recent. You know, in Saint, at St. Mary's College of Maryland, um, they had a German Shepherd and a Dwarf Rabbit. Um, Washington State University had a very interesting one. Um, they had a 95-pound pig um, that was requested as an emotional support animal to live in the dorms. They granted it. The student lived on the second floor of the dorm. Um, the pig wound up getting uh, his own form of anxiety and couldn't go on the freight elevator anymore. Uh, so they built a, uh, a litter box essentially for the pig. Um, students at that time really started to take significant issue with um, sort of the smells and whatnot that came with having a pig, having a litter box on the dorm floor. It's college. Yep, exactly. Um, eventually, um, the way that it was resolved is that the student wound up uh, moving into different housing and then eventually off campus, but they did grant the request. And, um, you know, it just shows sort of how high that burden is to, to establish that it could be a direct threat. Um, and uh, Western Washington University um, allowed for a six foot emotional support snake. Uh, so really no breed restriction, no animal restriction. I had heard about this, the snakes and the, the, the pig and the, the spy, I've heard about the spiders, mm -hmm. um, the lizards, and then my favorite is the um, sugar glider, which is <laughs> brought onto one small cup. In this case, for our listeners who do not know what a sugar glider is, I did not know either. It is an Australian marsupial that can fly. Yep. And is, is about the size of a guinea pig or another small hamster and uh, was requested as, a, as an emotional support animal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really... Um, range the gamut and I think um, you know you just you have to know that the type of animal or the breed really is not going to impact the analysis unless you have um, evidence of that specific animal posing a threat right um, so a question we get in this area a lot is you know what about a pet fee um, we would charge a pet fee if um, any other tenant was going to bring in their pet um, and have them here. There's likely going to be damage because this animal. We want to charge uh, the the student or the you know tenant um, a a fee in advance. And the EEOC and the ADA guidance on this, um, or the FHA guidance, excuse me, is pretty specific in saying that you cannot charge a pet fee in advance um, for an emotional support animal. Um, sorry. Oh. Got our slides back. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that is because they don't view this animal as a pet. Um, it is a service or support animal. And for that reason, they say that you cannot charge in advance a pet fee. Now, uh, the exception to that, I will say, is that if after a tenant um, has either left or during the time uh, you come to know that there's damage because of the animal, so whether 
carpet's been chewed or, um, you know, if you have beds in a dorm and uh, the wood has been chewed through or something like that, um, the tenant is responsible for that. Um, and that's the same if it's in their common area or if it's in their specific dorm room or condo unit, whatever that might be. So that's a similar concept, almost to public accommodations. Yep, it's like the handlers responsible for let them in, but what they do, they are on the hook for. Um, and so I think that's something to know and to explain to either a tenant or a potential student that if that's what they're going to do, um, you know, if that's their decision and you're granting the request, um, that they're going to be responsible for any fees associated with that and for maintaining and caring for the animal, obviously. Um, Another issue that I think comes up a lot and I've heard from clients is, you know, well, there are either regulations um, uh, within state or city ordinances that prohibit what types of animals can be in housing units. You know, can we have a mallard duck inside? Isn't this, a, isn't this prohibited under some sort of foul indoors ordinance? Or, um, you know, in Miami, and there's a specific case, Warren versus Del Vista condos, um, there was an ordinance that prohibited pit bulls from uh, living inside, and there was a resident at this condo um, association who uh, came forward and said, I have an emotional support pit bull, had medical documentation from his doctor um, saying that he needed to have this animal as an emotional support animal. And one of the reasons for the condo denying it was they said, well, look, we have a county ordinance that we have to comply with. Um, we can't allow this animal in. Um, and we're denying your request for you to have it um, and live here. And um, the Southern District of Florida said, nope, um, you know, this is preempted by federal law. Um, this, uh, this is the FHA applies and you have to um, allow the animal in. Um, you know, this animal in particular, again, they sort of looked at that same direct threat um, analysis. There's, you know, pit bulls themselves could potentially be dangerous. Um, but you have no evidence that this pit bull is. Um, you have medical support from the individual's doctor supporting the request, and um, you need to allow it in. We are uh, federal law preempts here. So just something to think about if that's um, what you're looking to kind of get out of jail free on this one or avoid the accommodation request. It's very likely that um, if you are providing housing that you're going to have to comply with the FHA over whatever sort of city or um, state ordinance might be in place. It's good to know. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what can you do? Because uh, it may seem like your hands are completely tied here and you just have to allow the animals on uh, campus or uh, into your dorms or, or housing units. Um, one uh, tip and, and kind of bit of advice, I think, is enforcing the same code of conduct that you would with your students or your tenants on animals. Some colleges have done that, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And I think it's it's been successful. So if the animal destroys property, if they engage in unwelcome contact uh, to other students, if they are not toileting property uh, or properly, um, those are all bases to potentially, um, you know, either issue a written warning or eventually, um, you know, move to have the animal removed and excluded um, because just like you would with a student who would engage in those types of behaviors or a tenant who would engage in those types of behaviors, um, treat them the same way and think about it in that perspective. Um, you know, um, Will had talked about earlier, and I think the highest area where we've seen this, uh, the potential sort of for abuse, um, and, and use of potential pets, um, and kind of questionable credentialing and documentation is in the college higher education area with these requests. Um, so the documentation that you are entitled to receive is, um, you know, from a medical provider. It needs to be from an actual medical provider, and it needs to show that the student suffers from a disability and that the uh, animal is going to alleviate or help with an identified symptom. If you don't have that documentation, you are able to push back. You are able to say, you know, we need that before we're ever going to grant a request. So simply because an individual comes to you and says, I want this and I suffer from this, that's not enough. Um, so you can push back and you should, um, you know, again, we don't want people going um, on crazy inquiries. There are limitations on what you can ask, like we've talked about, um, but you are entitled to that documentation and you should ask for it. And then um, one other thing I've seen, and this is, this is kind of a, a different strategy, but 
a lot of colleges and, and higher education institutions are, are going this route in different, um, different ways, is sort of partnering and leaning in on um, the, the trend of animals helping with anxiety and stress. You know, um, there's numerous reports, and I don't think anyone would disagree, that um, student anxiety and depression are at all-time highs. And um, higher education institutions are really tuned into that and are trying to address that. And so they've been partnering with um, animal dog rescues uh, within their communities, having pet hugs or pet visit type events on campus, especially during finals. That's um, been a, a, a very recent and um, kind of large trend that I think has been very successful. And some uh, colleges are even going a step further and having on-site therapy animals in counseling type of roles who are available um, for students to meet with and to utilize um, and uh, to kind of help reduce stress and, and have that bond. And, and I think the goal is there, maybe that will help uh, counterbalance um, the, the amount of individualized requests they get if, if they're sort of offering that. Um, I don't know if there's any empirical data showing that that has helped in that, but I think those are sort of strategies that people are um, looking to, to to help in that area. Everyone's taking a proactive approach, knowing, anticipating that these requests or needs will appear, almost similar to, I want a protocol in place if I have these types of issues. Because I, I know I, we may have an issue like this, and I just want to be proactive about it rather than reactive to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've gotten a number of questions, um, and we are going to try and get through as many of, uh, of them as we can in our next few minutes here as we wrap up the presentation. Feel free to keep them coming. Any that we cannot get to, um, we will address offline, um, but please feel free to keep submitting them, and we will try and get through some of them now. Yeah, these are some great questions. These are some great questions. I'm going to start with the first question that compares, again, as we've done today, the respective rights of employers versus places of public accommodations. Now, the question here is, do employers have the same rights as places of public accommodation when an accommodation is made, but the employee shows, uh, I think the animal shows behavioral issues with handling the animal or the animal dis demonstrates behavioral issues with other humans, growling or worse, attacking employees and customers. Now, Steve talked about that in the title three contexts for places of public accommodation where inappropriate behavior by the animal, aggressive behavior by the animal, hostilities are grounds to exclude that animal. And in the employment segment, it's you're probably going to have a little bit different language, but the same concept is going to exist, but it's going to be in the reasonable accommodation context because that animal's inappropriate behavior may render that accommodation unreasonable or it may impose an undue burden on the business operation to have to keep an animal in the workplace that is is outwardly aggressive and the question growling or attacking other employees that may become an undue hardship and particularly if you look at one of the areas of undue hardship uh, or unreasonableness under title one of the ada you know safety in terms of the operation uh, and so you do have the right to consider that it's going to be a slightly different analysis, but again, it's going to be under the reasonableness and undue hardship analysis for the employer. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a little bit more of an, a specific question, but um, so uh, an individual was shopping recently at a store and saw a couple um, with two cats on leashes that were with other shoppers. Um, what if an individual was with um, her and um, had a severe cat dandler? At what point is the public in more danger than the person with um, the disability? So um, I think this is sort of getting to that issue that we talked about earlier, which is um, something that's very tough for public accommodations, uh, places of public accommodation to deal with. Now, um, that store in particular, based on the uh, guidance, um, would not necessarily have to provide a, um, a allow a cat in to a place of public accommodation. Um, you know, the definitions are are pretty narrow there um, as to what constitutes a service animal in a place of public accommodation. It might be that source policy that, you know, they just sort of allow that and um, uh, because they don't want, you know, their employees asking questions. Like I said, you know, the questions are pretty limited in what you can ask and challenge. 
Um, but I think, you know, in that instance, that is an opportunity for you to potentially go to the store and say, you know, there are, I understand there are issues um, in place of public accommodation of allowing individuals with um, disabilities to have animals here. Um, you know, my husband or significant other, whoever it might be, has a uh, significant allergy. You know, what can we do in this instance to try and balance that and work with the store directly to try and and manage that um, because you know they are in a difficult situation in allowing having to allow both and um, and trying to work with them to collaborate. Now, the question of what does it mean to perform a task or work for an individual, or does that count? So the question is: Is calming someone down a task? And if an individual states that the dog makes them calm when stressed, and I think this this could be a question for an employee or an applicant who wants to bring a dog into the workplace or in a place of public accommodation. So maybe we both can comment on that. Let me start by saying the, if it's in an, an employment context and, in the, in, and it's, as part of the interactive process, you learn or the employee or the applicant makes a representation that this is a type of dog that makes them feel calm. I think it's gonna depend on precisely what the, the, the animal provides. Now, the other thing, uh, and just kind of from someone of a definition, it probably depends on how the, the animal makes it feel calm. So the, in the DOJ FAQ, they specifically describe a type of animal that is assisting somebody with anxiety. This is as part of the q and if you look at the, the most recent Q&A for the Department of Justice. And it's the person with anxiety that, that struggles with that and struggles with attacks, and the dog is, is putting the paw on the animal. Now, whatever you want to call that type of animal, what the DOJ comments on the FAQ is, that could potentially be a, ta a type of task, that the, the dog is putting the paw on the individual to calm them down during an anxiety episode. That could be a task. Now, it's not clear necessarily from the question if the dog is taking some type of action to calm the individual down um, or or if the dog is just sitting there to take the to, to calm the individual down, that could be the distinction between whether or not it's actually a service animal, or whether or not it's some type of companion animal. But remember, in the Title Three, in the Title One ADA context, you're treating it, whether it's a service animal or a uh, emotional support animal, you're still evaluating it for reasonableness and undue hardship as part of your interactive process to see if that if having that animal in your workplace is going to be reasonable or not do hardship. Now, in the Title III context, it can be tricky because you're only going to ask that question and then you'll get an answer. Yep. And I think the thing to think about here, too, um, based on at least this question is, you know, is this animal helping someone because of a disability, right? Um, you know, everyone experiences stress. Um, and, um, you know, if the individual does not suffer from a disability, um, in, in really any context, um, you are not required to grant them that even if the animal does calm them down. Um, now I know that can be challenging and the individual may prevent, pro provide a medical condition that they suffer from that they say stress is a symptom of, but um, I think if it's just simply, you know, I get stressed out and this is how I calm myself down, this is the best strategy for me, um, you know, my recommendation in that instance would be offering and kind of talking about other potential stress relievers that someone may be able to um, utilize, whether it's in the workplace, um, whether it's elsewhere, um, that would allow them to do that. Oh, yeah, the same clinical outcome by alternative means. Exactly. Let me address two questions that I think raise the issues out that uh, we didn't have time to address today. I talked at the outset of our webinar about having to make difficult decisions about content within the hour questions that are specific to specific industries. So one about food handling areas and one about places uh, of medical treatment where infection control may be an issue. What I wanna say is it's unfortunate we, we, we didn't have time to really cover that in the gamut. But let me say this to the, the, our, our uh, attendees who asked these. Very recently, the EEOC published some guidance, uh, disability related issues and other I issues for uh, food service employers, there is a segment of that guidance that addresses service dogs in, in areas that are covered by the FDA code. Um, it's a, it, it's, it's a, it, in the portion of it that's Q&A, it's very helpful. 
happy to talk about that offline. And then the Department of Justice, in its in some of its guidance, does discuss areas where there is medical treatment being provided, um, and has some discussion on that. Happy to um, to discuss that as well, um, and that guidance and how it might apply to whomever joined us today and had that question. So good yep. question indeed. And that is a good question and a point of clarification, um, again, in trying to keep all of these buckets clear. Um, who enforces the public accommodation provisions and, and where is that guidance coming from? That's coming from the Department of Justice. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. Yeah, we were talking about DOJ. Yes. Like oh, there, there was a question about that? Yes. Oh, all right. Yes, yeah. yep. Um, and, um, you know, we got another question or two questions sort of about preemption, um, and this will be the last one um, as it relates to HOA covenants. Um, you know, from what I've seen in case law thus far and sort of um, what it seems to be the applying is that you would not be able to contract that potential right away um, and that federal law would preempt, you know, a, a covenant um, in uh in a contract that you may have within your um, HOA, um, if somebody was able to show that you know they met all the requirements under federal law to have the animal um, as an accommodation, so um, that would be you know um, what my uh, what my takeaway would be there. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, great thank remarks, you. Great insights for the time. Thank you, Quarles and Brandon. Thank you for all of us who have joined the webinar, and we are signing out. Please yes. enjoy your lunch, enjoy your afternoon, and we're happy to answer questions offline about this tricky subject. Thank you.